This is ProBlogger. Hey there, friends. Welcome to episode 242 of the ProBlogger podcast. My name's Darren Rouse, and I'm the blogger behind ProBlogger, or as my American friends like to say, uh, ProBlogger. Um, I, uh, at a recent conference, had a number of people say, I love the way you say ProBlogger. Um, never really thought about that before, but ProBlogger is a blog, podcast, event, job board, and a series of eBooks all designed to help you to grow as a blogger. <laughs> to grow your audience, uh, and to build some profit around your blog as well. You can learn more about ProBlogger at problogger.com. Now, today's episode is brought to you by our 31 Days to Build a Better Blog course, which launches uh, this month. We are currently taking a group of about 100 bloggers through this course in its beta version, and we're kind of getting very close to being able to launch it for everyone. The feedback coming in has been fantastic so far. So if you are interested in improving your blog, uh, taking it to the next level, I really encourage you to head over to problogger.com forward slash 31 days, number 31 days to register your interest in the course, or if you're listening to this in a week or two's time, it should be already live and you can just enroll in the course. We've designed this course really to take you through a month of teaching, but more importantly, some action items which are designed to help you to improve your blog. Whether you're a new blogger or whether you're more of an intermediate blogger and been going for a while, this is a uh, system that we've been using since about 2009 in previously in ebook format. It's helped tens of thousands of bloggers to really level up their blogs. And uh, I encourage you to check it out. So head over to problogger.com forward slash 31 days. Now, in today's episode, I'm tackling a question about creating products to sell on your blog. It's a question that came in from one of our group members on Facebook, Kathy, who was asking around uh, how often she should be creating new products for her particular blog. Uh, she's been creating eBooks, and so I talk a little bit about how often, how frequently you might want to be creating products, and also we dig in a little bit to how to schedule that and how to roadmap that and also how to select which products you want to talk about. How do you choose the right topics? And I'm going to dig in a little bit to format of uh, products as well. I really want to give you an insight, particularly how we do that over on Digital Photography School, where we've released over 20 eBooks, a number of courses, and some other products as well. You can get today's show notes with a full transcription of this episode at problogger.com forward slash podcast forward slash two four. Two. Creating great content, finding an audience, building engagement, monetizing your blog. This is Pro Blogger. So, Kathy Frooks head over in our Facebook group this week asked this question. She says, I've written a total of five self published books and ebooks since I started writing my blog in 2011, but I haven't written anything in the last two years. I thought maybe I was doing too much in too little time. I published approximately one per year. I know you've published many books on ProBlogger and Digital Photography School. How often did you publish books? And did you keep a schedule? For these, and what was your thought process around choosing themes for the ebooks that you published? I feel like I should be doing something this year, but I also feel like I've done plenty in the past, so not sure what to do next. Thank you for everything you do. Um, and then she uh, adds in her URL horse listening. Dot com. Horselistening.com is the blog if you want to check that out. Thanks so much for the question, Kathy. I'm going to tackle the three main questions that you asked there and then also throw in a few other questions as well. First question there was, how often do we publish ebooks? Now, I'm going to particularly focus upon digital photography school because we do have more products on that, and that has been my main focus over the years. ProBlogger is a smaller site, and whilst we have had ebooks there, we are now starting to convert some of those over into a course format. And so that's probably a topic we could talk about on another day, although I'll touch on some of our thinking of that perhaps today as well. But over on Digital Photography School, which is my main blog now, we've been publishing e 
ebooks and other products since 2009. Previous to that, I'd been doing affiliate uh, promotions and relying more heavily upon advertising revenue to monetize that site. So since 2009, when I did my first ever ebook, um, we've published, I think it's 24, maybe 25 ebooks on the site. But I should add that we've really slowed down on the amount of ebooks we've been publishing because we have been doing more courses. And we've also done some software products as well. So uh, since 2009, 24 ebooks, but I think there's also five courses and three or four Lightroom preset packs as well. So it's probably closer to 35 products since 2009. So on average, it's probably three to four products per year that we have published. The first year from memory was quite slow. We may have only done one in that first 12 months, but then have begun to ramp it up. We did have one year where I think we released five products in a year, but we've slowed that back down now to three to four products product launches per year. Um, So around one per quarter is the frequency that we're operating from at the moment. And there's a number of reasons for that that I'll get into in a moment. Um, Your second question there, Kathy, was do we keep a schedule? Yes, the answer, um, the simple answer is yes, we try and plan out our year in advance. So at the end of last year, we sat down as a team and said, what products do we want to create in the next year. In fact, what we do is think about it a little bit more broadly than what products do we want to create. We actually think about what do we want to promote over the next 12 months. And so we begin to form a calendar that not only has the products that we will create and launch, but also any other kinds of promotion that we'll be doing. We always at the end of every year do some sort of a Christmas or Thanksgiving promotion. Sometimes we do both of those. We usually do a launch uh, or promotion in the middle of the year, which we call our mid-year sales. So these are times that we do some affiliate promotions and also put some of our current or our older products on sale as well. So we, we factor those things into our year and then around those we think about when do we want to launch new products of our own as well. So we are thinking ahead we're really probably thinking about 12 to 18 months ahead at all times. Now, sometimes it's just a matter of, um, you know, when we're thinking about, you know, 18 months out, we're not really going to a lot of detail as to what the products will be. We uh, maybe have a, a vague topic in mind, but um, certainly as things get closer, within six to 12 months, we're beginning to really form what those products will be, who's going to be responsible for creating them. And so we've developed, I guess, really a system now to think about those types of things. The other thing that we factor into our 12 to 18 month plan is anything that we want to relaunch or anything that we want to update. And that's something I will talk about a little bit later in this podcast as well, because now that we do have... 24 ebooks and a number of courses and other products, we need to also be paying attention to whether those older products are still relevant for today. Do we need to retire them or do we need to update them? And there's been a number of products that we have relaunched either uh, with smaller updates and then just putting them back on sale to let people know or completely um, rejigging them as well. And one good example of that is our 31 Days to Build a Better blog course that we're doing at the moment. It used to be an ebook. We are completely overhauling it, even though it really does have the same sort of format as previous ebooks. So that's the other factor, and that may be something that you want to think about, Kathy. Your first product, if you created that in 2011, which I think is when you said you started, that's now seven years old. So do you want to update that? Is it time for a refresh, a second edition, if you like? And so that might be something that you want to think about. And I will touch a little bit more on that in a moment. So some of the, the things that we are, I guess, factoring in when we're thinking about the frequency of new things is that it's it's really going to depend upon a number of factors. You know, how often you launch a new product is going to partly depend upon your ability 
to create the new product. Now, if you're like most bloggers, you're probably juggling, you know, other work, perhaps um, other responsibilities, family or community groups that you're a part of, um, friendships, <laughs> and those types of things. I, I chuckle there because I know many bloggers who would be saying, "Friends, I don't have time for friends." Um, <laughs> but really, there's a, a, a number of other things that you're going to be juggling there, plus your blogging responsibilities. And I don't know how often you're publishing new content and doing social media, but you know, life gets busy. And so our ability to create a product really is going to vary from uh, situation to situation. Also partly depends upon the type of product that you're going to create as well. If you are creating, you know, shorter eBooks, you know, I know some bloggers who have 10 page ebooks. They don't even call them ebooks, they call them workbooks or printables. Um, some of those products they can turn around in a week. They could create those things. But other ebooks, for example, the ones that we create on Digital Photography School, some of our ebooks are two or three hundred pages long. They're beautifully designed. They take us six months to create. Um, and we've got a team working on them. So it really is going to depend upon your ability to create the new products, the type of products that you're creating as well. It's also going to partly depend upon your topic. Now, I don't know exactly what your topic is. I had a quick look at it, and I don't really know how big or broad your topic is, and that, that would be one of the things I would be factoring in. My blog, Digital Photography School, is pretty broad. We talk about all kinds of photography, so um, that gives us a lot of options when it comes to creating ebooks or, or products. We could do wedding photography. We could do how to make money from photography. We could do portraits, landscapes. We could then get into post-production. You know, how do you process your images? We could talk about gear. So there's so many different subcategories on our blog. And so that lends itself to lots of different potential products. Other people have niches that are much more narrow and there's really not as much to write about and um, less options when it comes to products as well. And so perhaps that's a factor that you need to consider as well. As you look at your five current eBooks or books, is there gaps around uh, the topics you've already covered or have you covered everything that there already is to cover? That is gonna be something to keep in mind. You're listening to Pro Blogger. Another factor to keep in mind is your audience's fatigue. Um, sometimes you can create so many products that your readers get confused by the amount of products that you've got, or they just get worn out from you create always creating and launching a new product. And to be honest, this is something we've run into uh, over the years. The danger is that you can have so many products that your audience just becomes a little bit numb to the idea of you launching something. I know when I first launched my very first ebook, my audience, that was new to them. They'd never seen us launch an ebook before. This is our first thing. And so they were really open to hearing about that. Now we've already launched 35 or so different things that I guess with our older time readers um, can numb them a little bit to that. And so that's another thing that you need to keep in mind. Now there's some pros and cons of, of launching lots of products um, or not many products. The danger of going too long between your launches, so I think Kathy mentioned two years between the last time she um, launched a, a product. The danger of um, that kind of length is that effectively you could be leaving money on the table from your most avid fans. Um, there are a segment of your audience, Kathy, who are waiting for your next product. They will buy everything that you launch. Um, and by not launching anything for two years, that's two years where they have wanted to give you money for something and you've not had anything for um, them to make that exchange with. And so two years between your launches, to me, feels a little bit too long. It probably depends upon what other things you've got going in terms of income, um, but I do wonder whether perhaps creating something else might be good because you've probably got fans there who've bought your previous stuff, who've been satisfied by what you have sold them in the past, and they are ready and waiting to buy something else. It takes a lot of work to find a customer. It takes less work to sell a, a satisfied customer a second thing than um, to find a new customer all the time. So that's one of the, I guess, costs of taking a long time to release products. On the flip side of that, I do know bloggers who become too reliant upon their launches and they, they are always launching something new 
And this can go the other way. Their, their audience, as I mentioned before, can get a bit burnt out uh, and become numb to their marketing. And this burns out the list. It can also burn you out as a creator as well, if you're creating too many things as well. And it also means that you become very reliant on promoting things in launch mode or discount mode as well. And you don't pay as much attention sometimes when you kind of get into this cycle of always launching something. You may not be paying as much attention into the systems to generate the long tail sales. So, you know, if if you come to digital photography school today, we've got systems in place to get you to our 24 previous ebooks. One of the dangers of always be releasing something new is that you can not work on those systems as well. And that's something that comes um, at a bit of a cost to um, ongoing sales of your products as well. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is you want to get that balance right between creating new and fresh things to, to keep your customers engaged, to increase the long-term value of um, those, those customers, but you don't want to burn those customers out. You want to work on the systems as well. So when new people come to your site, they can see the new things that you've got as well. Another thing that I've already kind of touched on there is don't just work on new things. I would encourage you to think about how you can update those older books or eBooks that you've already got. Um, I learned this, the power of this the first time um, we did the the hardcover version of the ProBlogger book, which we published with Wiley. I wrote that book with Chris Garrett. And then about a year and a half later, Wiley came back to us and said, we want to do a second edition. And part of the reason for that was that the topic had dated. And um, so there was a need to update the content in the book. But also Wiley said, well, the other reason is that some people will buy both versions as well. And so think about there, you know, could you be taking one of those older products and updating it significantly enough that it's going to bring new value to your previous customers as well? We did this with 31 Days to Build a Better Blog. Back in 2009, I published that for the first time as an ebook. Three years later, I did a second edition of that ebook. It was quite um, heavily updated. It was a new version of the same sort of format. So we took the format of 31 days of teaching and activities, and we added some new days. We took out some old days. We updated every single day in that ebook. And it was a, enough of an update that previous buyers of the ebook wanted to buy the new one. Now, at that time, I think we offered a discount to anyone who'd bought it before so that they got some, I guess, extra value out of that of being a long-term customer. And now, of course, we're doing it again in a completely different format. We're taking the ebook version, we're putting it into a course, which is, um, I think, a, a lot better than the ebook version as well. So maybe there's something in that for you, Kathy, as well. Maybe one of those early books that you've done, um, maybe you could give that a refresh or a complete overhaul, which enables you to sell it again to a long-term customers with a discount if you'd like, um, but it also makes it more attractive and more useful to new customers as well. Creating great content and building your audience. This is ProBlogger. So they're the type of things that I would encourage you to be thinking about when it comes to frequency of your launch. Um, And I guess the other thing I would say is with um, Digital Photography School, one thing we've been trying over the last 12 months is to also do um, what we're I don't, don't really know what to call them, but in essence, they're a periodic kind of relaunch of a product. So on Digital Photography School, we have a course that we only open up once every six months. So we put it on sale for uh, three or four weeks, and then we get a, a new batch of students, and we take those students through the course. And once those three or four weeks come about, we shut the course down And in terms of taking on new students. And so this is us relaunching a product two times a year. Um, and this means we don't have to create that product from fresh again. It's not a new product, but it's a relaunch. And so this is, I guess, guess another alternative for 
creating new things is to actually only make them available for certain types of time. Now, it probably isn't going to work for an ebook, but it would does work for a course, particularly when you're going to take a group of people through a course over time. And so that's another thing that we factor into our promotional schedule at the start of the year. Last thing I say about a higher frequency of creating products is that it does give you more products which you can then use to upsell or bundle. This is one of the the beauties of having 24 ebooks already published and another 10 courses is that when we launch a new product, we can often add an upsell in our shopping cart. So um, when we did our last course launch, we were able to bundle that with an ebook. So some people just bought the course, but some people saw the offer to get an ebook at 50% off, and so that became a higher purchase as well. So um, it does give you a little bit more option there. You've already got five products, Kathy, so you can already be doing that type of thing. You could be doing two-for-one deals or those type of upsells, but more products can help with that as well. So the last question that Kathy asked was, what was your thought process for choosing the themes for your eBooks? Um, and I guess I would extend this to our courses as well. The first eBook that I did on digital photography school was on the topic of portraits. Um, I think for memory, it was called the Essential Guide to Portrait Photography. The reason I chose that topic, well, there were a number of reasons. One, it was a proven topic on the blog. I knew that blog posts on the topic of portraiture always did well. So that was a hint that people were probably more likely to buy that product. To be honest, it was a a topic I knew I could write a good book on um, because I had experience with it. And it also wasn't too hard for me to write it because a lot of that content was already written on the blog. And and that first ebook particularly was a repurposed content largely. So um, I chose that first book on those kind of factors The second ebook we did was quite different though. It wasn't on a topic or a subtopic. It was pitched at a particular level of expertise. And that book was very much focused on the topic of photography for beginners. So it was broader. It was on all types of photography, but it was for beginner photographers. And so it was a little bit of a different kind of focus there. It wasn't on a a niche. It was on more focused on the level. And since that time, we've largely stuck to those two options or we've combined them together. So we've done books that have been on portraits, landscapes, travel photography, um, and natural light, different types of lighting. Um, but we've also done further eBooks that have been focused on beginners and more intermediate levels as well, and others that have combined those things. So we've done portraits for beginners, for example. So there's some of the things I guess we keep in mind. Some of the other factors that we can, I guess, consider, I always ask, have we covered this topic on the blog before? And how has it gone? That to me is probably the first thing I think about. If I've published content on the blog and it has bombed, it hasn't done well, it's a signal to me that an ebook probably won't do well as well. But if we've done lots of posts on that particular topic and they've always done very well in terms of traffic, engagement, interest, um, enthusiasm from our audience, then that's a signal to me that maybe that's a topic that we should choose for an ebook or a course as well. How to build and monetize your blog. This is ProBlogger. Also thinking about the broadness of the interest. So we do have, we get really good response when we write about bird photography, for example. So photographing, you know, birds, eagles, owls, those type of things. They always do really well, but when we think about it, it's a, quite a small focus for our audience. There's only a small group of our audience who are interested in it. Even though they're avid, I'm, I'm not sure that it's the right topic for an ebook for us. And so we've never done anything that niche We tried to be a little bit more broad. We are going to experiment with some smaller products in the future that are a little bit more niche just to experiment with that. But my gut feeling is that we want to choose broader appeal type topics. Another factor that I do consider is, is the topic too broad? for one product. So, um, you know, the topic of portrait photography is actually a very broad topic. And whilst the first ebook I did did quite well, another thing in the back of my mind as I'm choosing topics now is could this be more than one product? So we actually took that first portrait ebook off the market 
it was my first one. It wasn't as good as what it could have been, but also the other reason I took it off the market was because I saw I could replace it with four or five eBooks on that particular topic. So now if you're going to look at our range of um, eBooks, we have a f- portrait photography book called Making the Shot, which is sort of an introduction to making um, portraits. We have one called Lighting the Shot, which is all about lighting portraits. We've got one about posing portraits. We've got another one about processing the photos that you get in Lightroom. So we've got a variety of eBooks all about portraiture. And so this is another thing that you might want to consider is how can you replace one of your eBooks with four or five of your eBooks? It's another way to roll out more products. It enables you to go a little bit deeper into each of those topics, but it also opens up options for bundling as well and upselling. And this is something that we do quite successfully on Digital Photography School is we bundle those four or five portrait photography eBooks together and that it becomes quite a compelling offer. You know, you might be able to um, buy five Five, but pay for three, that type of thing. So um, that has worked quite well for us as well. Another thing to factor in uh, as you're choosing topics is could you extend upon something that you um, have previously already done that has worked well? So picking up that portrait photography idea, once we came to that series of the end of that series of, of ebooks, we started to think, well, portrait photography's done well for us. What else could we do? And we've covered most of the main topics there, but what else could we offer? So one of the things we did an experiment with was to create, um, I think it's called 14 Amazing Portrait Recipes. And it's a small ebook. It's more of a case study type ebook. And so it's, again, it's something else that we've offered. And again, it enables us to bundle that as well. So you may have already covered all the topics, but could you could you take a different slant on things? And could you build upon the little library that you've already got? Another thing we did with portraits was to create what we call a printable, a posing printable. It's 67 poses that you can use in your portrait photography. So again, it's not an ebook, it's something else that relates to the topic. So There can sometimes, when you kind of get to the end of a a range of topics that you've covered, sometimes there are other things that you can create that can become nice little companion products to other products that you've got. Another factor that I always consider before doing a product is have we done an affiliate promotion of something similar to that? And this is something that I highly recommend anyone who's thinking of creating a product would do. Try and find someone else's product that you can promote as an affiliate first. It's going to teach you so much about creating products. You're going to begin to see what your readers respond to. You can see the price points that they respond to as well. Uh, And essentially, it allows you to test whether your product is going to work. Now, you don't want to just reproduce what someone else has already created. You need to be really careful about that, particularly with plagiarism. It's also just not going to be good for your brand if you're seen to be creating something that's too similar to someone else, but you can learn a lot by promoting other people's products before you create your own. And so that's another factor that um, we would keep in mind. You're listening to ProBlogger. The last thing that I'm always thinking about is what's the best format for the product. So Kathy's talked about eBooks and books, but maybe one way to extend your product lineup would not be to create another book or eBook, but to create something else. So you might create a course. Maybe you should be thinking about a membership site. Maybe you should be thinking about printables or templates or t-shirts or coffee mugs. I don't know what it would be, but maybe there's something quite different that would be complementary to what you've already got or quite different to what you've already got as well. Sometimes some topics just lend themselves better to more of a course type teaching uh, or a printable or a membership. So maybe you should be thinking about that. The other thing I'd say on that front is that sometimes actually having a course and an ebook can be best. So on Digital Photography School, the second ebook that we ever did was called Photo Nuts and Bolts. It was an ebook for beginners in photography. We still sell that ebook today, but we've also got Photo Nuts and Bolts, the course. So some people prefer to read, some people prefer to watch. Some people prefer to get both, and so they bundle those two things together. So maybe your ebook um, little library that you've already got, maybe that could be rolled out 
as courses as well, either to um, offer people the alternative or to get both together as a bundle. I know that's a lot of information to digest. I hope it's kind of answers your question, Kathy. One last thought for you, though. I know a lot of people who do very, very well with lots of regular launches. So um, similar to what we do in digital photography school, they've got lots of products. That's their model. It works really well for them. But I do know a number of bloggers who just have one product and they focus all their energy on promoting that one thing. And in some ways, that's a much simpler model and they have a lot less headaches than we do at Digital Photography School with lots of different products and always having to update them. Um, and so both can work. The one thing I would say is that the people I see doing best with one product or just a handful of products, they generally have an audience that is always lots of fresh people coming in. So they may be doing really well with search engine optimization, always bringing new people in. And the other thing that most of them do is instead of selling an ebook, which is a sale that they get once, they generally have some kind of way of getting a recurring income from their sale. So that type of model of one product does lend itself perhaps a little bit better to a membership site or some sort of a subscription as well. So maybe, uh, I don't know, again, your topic, whether it would lend themselves to um, people who would sign up for a monthly subscription to get some regular content from you and maybe a community area, but that might be another model. It means that you do get that one sale or that one customer but you keep that customer engaged as well, which increases the lifetime value from that customer as well. I hope that somewhere in the midst of that advice uh, is something that's going to spark some ideas for you, Kathy, and everyone else who's listening as well. If you've got any further advice for Kathy, you can do a couple of things. You could join our Facebook community. Uh, just search for Pro Blogger Community on Facebook and join that group, and uh, you'll be able to find Kathy in there and the question that she asked. Or perhaps you want to leave a comment on our show notes at problogger.com forward slash podcast forward slash 242, where we've got comments and uh, you can leave a comment there as well. I hope that you've uh, got some value out of that. If you've got a question you'd like to see in a future podcast as well, feel free to pop it in the comments on the show notes or over in the Facebook group as well couple of last things for you uh, to wrap up today's show. If you want to think a little bit more about products, uh, listen to episode 67. It's uh, one which I did a year or so ago now on the topic of why you should create a product to sell on your blog. So if you're not quite there yet on whether products are right for you, that one's a good one to listen to. I also give you some tips on how to create that product. And then over on the Pro Blogger blog, I wrote an article earlier this year called Seven Times types of products that you could sell from your blog as well, which might be a good companion piece for today. I talk there a little bit about eBooks, of course, because that's where we started out, but also give you some other ideas on different types of products uh, for those of you who maybe aren't quite suited to the eBook. Lastly, I want to say thank you to a number of you who've been leaving reviews on the podcast this week. I just got my email this morning from the service I use to report on the new reviews that come in. I had one from T. Melville, Melville, sorry, who came in. Uh, T. Melville, I don't know whether this is a him or a her, um, but T. Melville uh, wrote, I googled imposter syndrome, something I have diagnosed but really wanted to explore, and I found ProBlogger. And I fell in love. Well, I thank so much for falling in love, Darren. T. Meville goes on to write, is the epitome of everything I had no idea that existed. He is real. He is humble. He is everything you need to understand and build your blog. I incidentally heard one episode, uh, episode 101, I think, and cannot stop listening. I ran into work to talk to a potential partner and was talking so fast and so excited. She was like, slow down. And I have not lost momentum yet. I love his very real information for everything you need to know. Everything. Thank you, Darren. Well, thank you for leaving your review. And also, AJ Reed wrote, great podcast. I listen regularly. Rouse speaks from experience and has a laid back style. And he isn't just there to sell me something. Learning so much. Highly recommend this podcast. Thanks so much, AJ. And thanks, uh, T. Melville, for your uh, reviews. If you've got a review for us, head over to iTunes today and uh, rate us and review us. 
Office or over on whatever app you do use as well. Um, I particularly get notified when the iTunes ones come in, but I try and watch those other app services as well. So if you've got a moment, I would love you to do that. Otherwise, dig into the archives. There's uh, 241 other episodes there for you and uh, episode 67 particularly on the topic of products. Thanks for listening. I'll be back with you next week in episode 243. You've been listening to ProBlogger. If you'd like to comment on any of today's topics or subscribe to the series, find us at problogger.com forward slash podcast. Tweet us at problogger. Find us at facebook.com forward slash problogger or search problogger on iTunes. Before I go, I want to give a big shout out and say thank you to Craig Hewitt and the team at Podcast Motor who've been editing all of our podcasts for some time now. Podcast Motor have a great range of services for podcasters at all levels. They can help you to set up your podcast, but also offer a couple of excellent services to help you to edit your shows and get them up with great show notes. Check them out at podcastmotor.com.